dudes and dudettes. Welcome back to The Anxious Truth. This is episode number 155, 155. Welcome back to the show. Recording early May 2021. Early spring day here in New York. It actually looks like it's a pretty nice day. But I am here sitting at this microphone and we're going to talk about a thing today. I'm going to use a word that I have never used in 155 episodes of this podcast going back over six years, and that is trigger. Like I, We don't do trigger warnings. We don't use the word trigger very often because it's a counterproductive word. But I'm going to use the word trigger today because today's topic is the fear of death, like anxiety over death and existential anxiety. We're going to talk about these things. And a lot of people have, have wanted me to talk about this. And a lot of you listening may really want to hear this, but at the same time, you don't want to hear this. So just hear me out for 30 seconds. If you bail on the episode, that is not failure, right? So these are difficult questions for all human beings to confront and wrestle with and think about, right? We all do. Uh, and they're, they're hard questions sometimes in the best of times. In the grips of disordered anxiety, they may be even more difficult for you to confront these questions and deal with them and play with them in your head. And you may be in a situation right now that's not necessarily possible. So if you get a little bit into this podcast episode and you want to bail, that is not failure in any way. You can always come back and listen a little bit at a time as you're working through this, this thing, right? That's okay. So this episode's kind of designed for that. So stick with me and let's start this way. Well, before we do, you know, you know what? I'm just going to make this, I'm going to do the 15 second version of this. I wrote a book on how to recover from anxiety disorders. The book is called The Anxious Truth. It's really, really good because everybody tells me that it's really, really good. So I'm going to have to believe them and you can find it on my website at theanxioustruth.com slash recovery guide. So go check it out. And if you have it already and you like it, then head on over to Amazon and maybe take two minutes and write me a review. All right, there you go. So there's my little book plug that I always do at the beginning of every episode these days. And that was a short one. So let's get into this, right? The fear of death, death that comes along with anxiety, anxiety over death and existence and existential issues. Let's start on a, on a positive note here. And, and uh, here's the way we're going to want to approach this. Understand that right now, if you're having a really hard time with that concept, and, and let me preface this by saying I was you. This was a major, major problem for me to the point where I was in such a state that at the time my kids were small. They were, you know, six and two and eight and, you know, whatever, eight and four, whatever. They're two years apart. So those are the wrong ages completely. Totally, totally the wrong ages. Like I don't even know my kids' ages. But they were like six and four at the time. And I would not let them use the word dead or death. I could not hear the word death. Could not do it. Like that's how, how triggering it was for me. So I understand where you are right now. But consider this, the reason why it is such a struggle for you, and this is a struggle for all human beings to con confront these things, right? So understand that you're not you're not broken in any way. But in the state that you're in right now, where everything is magnified and distorted, you're going to have a more difficult time with this. But hear me out. If you're having a hard time with the fear of death and irrational, distorted, magnified fear of death, you're triggered by the idea, you're plagued by thoughts of existence and, the, and what is the point of all this and what is existence and what happens when we die. If you're plagued by these things every day, I promise you that can get better. As everything else gets better, that will get better too. So as you start listening to this, if you want to hit the eject button anytime, it's perfectly acceptable for you to do that. It's not avoidance. It's not running away. It's not any of those things. This is one of those things that you can approach bit by bit. But understand that as you do the work to recover from your anxiety disorder, and let me tell you that, you know, the, the fear of death and fixation on death and existence and existential dilemmas sometimes is, is an OCD thing, but it comes often with almost every variant of anxiety disorder at some point in that cycle. So agoraphobics have this, people with panic disorder have this, people with health anxiety have this. Like this is a common thing for anxious minds to latch on to. So you, you may be in the OCD camp, that this may be one of your issues and your subtype focuses on this, or you may not have OCD, but you're still triggered in a huge way by the thought of death, right? That's okay. As you do the work to deal with your panic disorder, your fear of anxiety, your agoraphobia, your monophobia, your health anxiety, as you do your ERP work for OCD, this will get better. I promise you it will. So while you may be terrified of what I'm going to say next right now, as everything else improves, your ability to, to tolerate this conversation and even participate in it will improve too, I promise you. Like I, I, was, I was as bad as you were, and now I am not. And I did not have to specifically solve my fear of death, right? So let me put that on the table right now, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. I did not have to specifically work on the fear of death 
I didn't have to specifically do exposures around death and things of that nature. Now, I also did not have, you know, an OCD subtype that was focused on death and existence. So, you know, full disclosure on that. My problem was primarily panic disorder and agoraphobia, and I would have those obsessive thoughts that would pop in as a, alongside, you know, along for the ride with those other things. But I did not have to do death exposure, if you will. Like as my disordered anxiety began to fade and my ability to reason came back online, I was able to confront these things. And now I could talk about them all day long. Like they, the, what is terrifying to you right now can literally become a source of enjoyable conversation. It's philosophy. It's some of the highest form of like thought and pondering that human beings are capable of doing is pondering their own mortality. There can, be, there can be fun in that. There can be reward in that. There's a lot of very interesting discussion and debate to be had around that topic. And I can enjoy that now. Whereas back in those days, no way, no way, no references to death were allowed. I would not allow my then six and four year old daughters to use the word death or dead. And I remember, you know, when I finally got my act together and things got better for me, a couple of years after that, I, I had to circle back. They were still pretty young. And I said, look, I, you know, I, I, I had to apologize to them. I said I was unreasonable. We had to talk about it. I said at that stage, I, I was unable to process some of those things. And those are hard questions for people. And I'm sorry that I didn't let you say the word. You're, the word is okay. And we had to talk about that. But uh, I understand. If this is a tough thing for you to hear, I, I get that. I really do. So if you have to bail, you bail. You can come back anytime. This episode will always be at theanxioustruth.com slash 155. You can always find it there. So come back and listen a little bit at a time as you go, and, and maybe you'll get something out of it that way. So let's talk about this. Often, people who are in the grips of disordered anxiety will become intensely laser-focused on the idea of death, the fear of death, right? The fear of death, the fear of existing versus not existing. What is existence? Why are we here? What is the point if we're all going to die anyway? You know, there's just a lot of ways we can approach this. But one of the things that we have to really understand is that at its core, we, we are trying to find is some comfort in the face of that, right? We are trying to find comfort in the fate that we all share, that none of us wants to share at some level. And, it, you know, a lot of people will argue like, well, I'm not afraid of death. And, and that might be true. I'm not sure if I'm afraid of it anymore, to be honest with you. But at some level, I think probably all human beings have some fear of it. Again, that's a philosophical debate. We could probably have really interesting discussions about that for days and days. But in the end, none of us wants that to be our fate. But best estimates are, you know, since modern humans appeared 50,000 years ago, there have been 108 billion of us, roughly, plus or minus one or two. I'm <laughs> sure it's not totally accurate. But best estimates, about 108 billion modern humans, homo sapiens, have existed since we arrived here 50,000 years ago or so on this planet. And we kind of branched off from the pre previous humans. 108 billion of us have been here. Right now, there are about 7 billion of us. So that means 93 billion of us aren't here anymore, right? Because we all share the same fate. It is the commonality of, of human beings. This is, what, this is the fate we all share. And we become super afraid of that and fixated on that and focused on that. And we become obsessed with it. And we dig into it and we dig into it and we dig into it. We are trying to find some comfort in the face of what is a scary thing. We don't know. We don't know what that's all about. We have to accept it. We have no choice. But it doesn't mean we have to like it. And we will have varying degrees of trepidation about it, fear about it, all throughout our lives. That's normal. It's a normal part of being human. Sometimes we don't think about it at all. Sometimes we do think about it. Sometimes we could think, it about, think about it dispassionately than intellectually. Sometimes we think about it and get very emotional about it. When it happens to us and our families, when we lose loved ones, it is pushed in, pushed in our face and we are forced to confront our own mortality. These are hard questions. These are always hard questions for almost all human beings. So I cannot stress that enough. Like we have to normalize that, that discussion of death and the embracing of, of the concept of death, annihilation, non-existence, whatever you want to call it, whatever, whatever rocks your boat, whatever triggers you. This is, a, this is something that every human being you know, has dealt, deals with from time to time in some way, shape, or form. So there's a lot of normalcy in your fear. Like take heart in the fact that what you are experiencing is an incredibly normal human thing. In fact, a lot of people would argue that it's one of the things that makes us human is our, our knowledge of the future, the knowledge of our own mortality. You know, we know about it. We are aware of it. So, you know, are the other animals aware of it? There's some debate about that. You know, are elephants aware of it? Dolphins, the great apes, you know, some of the higher mammals, are they aware of it? Maybe, maybe, we're starting to think that maybe they are. They do, they do understand the concept when it happens, 
So, you know, wolves are clearly, clearly shown to grieve for the loss of a member of the pack. Elephants are clearly shown to grieve. Like, those animals, they display grief. They understand the concept of loss when one of their own is taken away by death. But do they understand it before it happens? We don't know that. But clearly, we do. It might be one of the things that, that is the essence, one of the parts that, of the essence of being human is, is an, understanding and a, an understanding and an acknowledgement of our own mortality. And that ain't easy. So, you know, there are the gifts that come along with being human. And then there are some things that don't feel like gifts sometimes. And this is one of them. You know, sometimes ignorance would be bliss, right? It'd be better if we just didn't know. So who knows? Uh, it, it puts us in an awkward situation emotionally, intellectually, spiritually, like existentially. It's a tough place to be. Being human ain't easy. So when you are struggling with the ideas of death and existence and non-existence and all of those really high unanswerable things, which we're going to get to in a second. There's, these are unanswerable questions. You're being very human. You're really expressing some of the most core things that make you a human being on planet Earth, and that's okay. So what is the issue here? You know, what is the issue? Why is it such a problem? If you're listening and you are agoraphobic, but you are also just driven by this fear of death, and you feel that your fear of anxiety and panic and, and your, your inability to leave the house or whatever it is going on in your life, if you feel it is driven by your fear of death, because uh, how could you not be afraid of death, Drew? Like, how could you can't tell me that's an irrational fear? It's true. It happens to everybody. No one escapes it. Like, yeah, you're right. So we, we, that's why I tried to tell you, like, it's not an irrational fear. Like, the fear of death by itself, if you take the fear of death by itself, it is not irrational because it is true. We all, this is a fate we all face. It is the commonality of all of us, every one of us. No one gets out. No one escapes that, right? So... That's not irrational. Being afraid of death is not irrational. But what happens when you are in that vulnerable state, when you are, you know, the thoughts are especially sticky and loud, when you're afraid of everything, when everything is a trigger, when your life is and just seems so tenuous all the time because you're just trying to get through every day without being in a complete panic all the time or without being in like this deep level of distress mentally, physically, emotionally all the time. You know, resiliency kind of goes out the window. Your ability to reason goes out the window. It is, that is a tough way to live. And then when confronted with this common fear that we all share, that, that rational fear that's like, yeah, I'm afraid of the unknown, man, to a certain extent. Why would we not be afraid of that, right, to a certain extent? But it becomes magnified. It is magnified. It is distorted. So the knowledge of what awaits all of us down the road, for most of us, I hope, in a very long time from now, especially if you're younger, you know, if you're 23 years old, if you're 27 years old, you're, you're listening to me right now. Odds are this is not a thing you have to worry about for a long time. You have a tremendous amount of living in front of you before that becomes an issue. But we never know. And that's true too, is the unknown that drives some of that. And the problem is that the unknown part of it, I think most people, I can speak for myself. When I was going through this stuff, you know, it was a while ago. I was in my early 40s. And I, I understood like one day this will come for me. But, you know, if you take conventional wisdom, it's like, well, I mean, you know, I mean, I wasn't terribly healthy at the time, but, you know, let's assume that everything goes my way and, and everything, and I get all the breaks. Like, well, I don't have to worry about this for quite a long time. I still have a, many years here to experience and, 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 and get into life and live life before I have to worry about that. But it didn't matter. Like, that part didn't matter, I think. It wasn't so much like I never want to die. It's just knowing that it would happen was really difficult. And the other thing that got really difficult is none of us ever know. Like, you really don't ever know. And this is where, you know, if, you, if you're getting a little squeamish on me, there are some things we're going to start to talk about here in very frank terms. So if you want to hit the eject button now, I'll, I'll get that. You can come back later and, and listen. Because right? we're going we're gonna to face some hard realities. I'm going to say some things that need to be said, but maybe you don't want to hear them. So if you need to, it's okay to eject now, really. It's okay. But the, the point that I'm going to make here is the uncertainty of death is part of it right? The uncertainty of death is part of it. We all truly do not know. We literally do not know in, in the vast, 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 vast majority of cases. When, what day will be our last? We don't know that. That's true. That's true. And since so many of the things that we talk about in this podcast and in the social media community surrounding the podcast is based on, a, on an intolerance of uncertainty, you talk about uncertainty. It's the ultimate uncertainty. Not knowing which day will be the last one for us is, a, is a, it's almost... You know, if you really think about it, even as somebody in complete recovery like me, that's a heady thing to put, to put on your shoulders. That's a big weight on your shoulders. You don't know what day is going to be the last one. 
And that drives a tremendous amount of this because what winds up happening is when you're in a state of disordered anxiety and your resilience is down and you're worn down and you're just afraid and uncomfortable all the damn time and just trying to find relief in a safe place to be, the, the distortion and the magnification turns that into this might be my last day, right? This might be my last day. That's, that's true. There's some, some level of, you know, unknowability in that. Who knows what's going to happen, you know? Interestingly enough, this morning I read an article that uh, is a bit of Chinese space junk that's about to come back to Earth this weekend. Everybody know that it was going to happen. That's what the Chinese do. They don't control their descent. So when stuff burns up, it just like they just roll the dice. So it made me think about that because I knew I was going to record this episode today. I said, you know, like we don't, nobody really knows where it's coming down. I mean, as uh, clearly as it as the event gets closer and closer, we'll be able to tell where it's going to come down because it's being tracked. But and the odds of it hitting somebody are like astronomical. The odds are probably better of somebody winning the lottery than getting hit by a you know piece of Chinese rocket junk that falls out of space. Nonetheless, the odds are not zero. They might be astronomically close to zero, but they're not zero, not zero. And I think that's that thing. I talked about it in the health anxiety episode. Anything where the probability is more than zero becomes intolerable. And if you just to pile on top of that, that the subject in this case is death, we have a less than zero or a more than zero uncertainty or probability that this will happen one day. You can see where uh, disordered anxiety and that state of being constantly in anxious arousal and not, not very resilient and not reasoning very well, you could see where the fear lens will just magnify and distort that into just torturous levels, just epic proportions. And it does. It really does. Some of the scariest moments that I can remember as I was really struggling had nothing to do necessarily with panic and, you know, the traditional exposure stuff and all stuff I talked about all the time. It was literally like the realization and, and, and of the concept of annihilation ceasing to exist would, would just fill me with absolute dread. All right, it went, now, now it doesn't. You know, I don't know what I think about that when I think about it now, but, but then it did. Then it did because I did not have any ability to really put any distance between me and that thought. Like the thought became fused right into like the core of me instantaneously. It was really difficult to do that. And it would just shake me right to the core, which it may be doing to you right now. I get that. But, you know, so what's happening is that your state right now, when you are afraid of everything, you, you have a very limited ability to tackle these higher questions like this. And I don't know if there's a higher question for anybody walking the planet than this one, the question of death and our own mortality and existence. There might not be a harder question than, you know, possibly. Maybe the existence of God. We can argue that maybe. But in the end, you know, is there any, you know, any question as to why you're struggling with this so much? Every human being will struggle from time to time with this question. And when you are worn down by anxiety, panic, fear, discomfort, vulnerability, uncertainty, all the damn time, and you're just trying to get some relief. Yeah, <laughs> these are hard things to think about. So do not beat yourself up for being in that position. And know that as you do the work to improve your overall situation, your ability to handle those thoughts will return also. There was likely a day when you could think about death and not go into freak out mode. Not love it. Certainly not love it. So but at least be neutral about it. Like, yeah, it's a tough topic. But you know what? It's not a topic I have to be worried about right this minute. Right this minute, I'm just standing at my desk talking to no microphone. I don't have to worry about it right now. And some might argue, you know, well, here's a good example of this. Of the irrationality, like the distortion, the magnification of disordered anxiety. I could say to myself right now, well, I'm not digging the idea that one day I won't be here. But I can also say that I don't have to worry about it right now. I'm just standing at my desk. It's a Friday morning. I look at the sun is shining. There's a squirrel playing in my garden out there. I'm, and I'm talking into a microphone to you good people. I don't have to worry about that right now. But disordered anxiety will tell me, how do you know that? I don't know. Maybe a tree is going to fall on the house and kill me right now. It's possible. Somebody might break into my house right now and shoot me. That's possible. The odds are not zero of that. They are not 0%. I could have a heart attack. I, something could happen right now that would take me out of this game. That's true. Except right now in the state that I'm in, I know that the odds of those things happening are so low that they are inconsequential in my processing of the moment right now. They don't matter. I can't factor those in because the numbers are so small that they don't factor into my thought process right now. However, when you are looking through the lens of distorted and magnified fear brought on by distort, uh, disordered anxiety and all the stress it has you under all the time, whoa, 
that like 0.0000000% chance that a tree will fall on my house right now becomes much larger than that. And I can't help but factor those things into my processing of this moment. So those things that are very unlikely to happen when viewed through that distorted and magnified lens become things that that might actually but they might happen anything more than 0% means they might happen and I have to consider them right now all the time. And that's the problem. Like that's the problem. So at any given moment from time to time, I am not factoring in the possibility of death into my thought process, nor are most of the people walking the planet right now. But you are you may be factoring that that possibility in no matter how remote it may be is factored into your thought process and the way you process every situation, every moment, every context, the way you make every decision. You know, you're weighing that variable as part of the equation all the time, whereas recovered people or people that are not in the grips of disordered anxiety are not weighing those variables. They, those variables do not exist in the equation at all. So let me put it a different way. If your job is putting out oil well fires, that's, a, that's the most dangerous job we have, right? Everybody always says, like, that's one of the most dangerous jobs. If one of your jobs is climbing radio towers, you're the guy that literally climbs on top of the, you know, the Patronus Tower, and like climbs up the mast that's another 300 feet in the air on top of that because you got to change the aircraft safety light bulb at the top of that thing. That's a dangerous job. If you're in law enforcement, you're in the military, you're in any sort of dangerous job like that. Well, you know, you factor in the, uh, you know, the chances of meeting your own mortality factor more into your decision making process and in your processing of things day to day. So that's true. Some people live in more dangerous occupations. Some people just engage in more risky activities. If you're a thrill seeker, and you like to do base jumping, you know, that sort of stuff, you like to jump out of planes, it's inherently more dangerous, you're taking a bigger risk. And in that situation, you may make decisions that are somehow, you know, where the, the, the possibility of death does factor in the variable becomes large enough to get put into the equation. But for most of us, the variables are so small, the value of that variable, if you think about it in math terms is so small, that it cannot actually influence the outcome of the equation. So it doesn't I throw it away, right, we throw it away. Your issue is you may just be sitting on your sofa today, but you are still factoring in the, the possibility of death as a variable factors into your equation moment by moment, as if you are jumping out of planes, dodging bullets or putting out oil well fires. See how that works? Like, and you may be factoring the death variable in at an even higher weight than somebody who is putting out oil well fires even though your plan for today is to sit in your living room, or to sit in your office or in your garden or to just drive your kids to school, whatever. And then since the variable even at rest holds a tremendous amount of weight in your equation an inordinate distorted magnified amount of weight in your equation, it doesn't, it hasn't earned but you've given it that or your fear has given it that, that when you go beyond just sitting on the sofa, I'm going to get in the car. Well, people die in car accidents. Okay, yes, that's true. So true, it is It is true, you have to acknowledge it is true that the odds, that variable, the death variable goes a little bit higher. If you go and ride in an automobile, we know this. But again, it's still so low that we don't factor it into our decisions. But for you, when the weight of the variable starts super high, even when you're sitting on your sofa, if you're going to go out of the house, where technically the variable would get higher for all of us, you're already starting at an astronomically high, unreasonably high weight of the death variable in your equation and it raises it even more. So the issue here, when you're talking about the fear of death that comes along with disordered anxiety, and the fear of existence, non existence, and all of those dilemmas, that this is a, an issue of magnification and distortion, just like anything else, right, just like anything else. So you'll notice at no point in this discussion, am I trying to soothe you and tell you that it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay, I mean, it is ultimately going to be okay, right? There's, there's a tremendous amount. And we're also not going to do the whole like, oh, get busy living or get busy dying. I'm not going to throw cliches like that at you. Yeah, they're all true. Like, you know, you spend so much time trying not to die that you forget to live. That's true. That's, that's true. There's truth and wisdom in that. And I can't deny that. But that isn't the solution to your problem. I think the solution to the problem really lies in understanding at a core level, at a basic level, why this has become such a weighty problem for you. Whereas maybe it wasn't in your past, but it is now, right? So and you'll I don't understand this, like, I'm so afraid of dying, I'm so afraid of death. Well, you know, that's, that's the anxiety lens. Those are the distortion goggles, the magnification goggles that you're wearing every day all day long. That is a problem. 
And so when that's why I say when you do the work, so how do I solve this problem? Do I have to do death exposures? How do you expose yourself to death? Do I have to watch like videos of funerals and things of that nature? No, not necessarily. So let me be specific, though. If you're dealing with a fixation on death and dying, because that is your particular OCD subtype, then yes, you're probably going to want to engage in some sort of exposure and re response prevention around those themes. That's true. But if that is not you, if you do not have OCD, right, if you're not, you don't have an OCD subtype focused on death and existence, and you have panic attacks, or you're agoraphobic, or you have health anxiety, then you have to understand that magnification. And no, you do not have to specifically work on your fear of death, you can work on all the other ways that we overcome those disorders. We build a new relationship with fear again. We turn down our threat response. The issue here always is that the threat response is just cranked up at a sensitivity level that it does not belong at, right? So when you do the work of modulating down that threat detection sensitivity level in your amygdala over time, right? We do our, we do our exposure work. We work on our new reaction. We stop checking our blood pressure and our heart rate all the time. We stop Googling symptoms. We start going out and walking or driving or engaging in social events again. When we do those things, we turn down that threat sensitivity monitor, you're no longer in fear all the time, you're no longer on a hair trigger all the time, you're no longer live on the, uh, living on the razor's edge of panic all the time, your resiliency starts to come back, your reasoning starts to come back online. And that fear of death will begin to shrink back down to sort of normal levels. You, you don't ever lose it, none of us ever lose it 100%. Well, again, we could debate that probably philosophically, but your goal is not to have, not to be like fearless in the face of death. That is not your goal. Your goal is to really have that fear and your concept and your pondering about death go back into a normal place in your life, as opposed to dominating your life. It doesn't have to dominate your life. Because here's the reality of this. Worrying about dying does not prevent it. It does not prevent it. Now, I'm not talking about like taking care of yourself and eating well and getting regular checkups and having a good diet and exercising. Yes, we can do all of those things. We can do all of those things, right? You should take good care of yourself. Not to prevent death, but to just have a better life. So you know, if I'm going to spend some time in the gym, I'm not doing it so that I don't die. I'm doing it so that every day that I live, I actually have a better time doing that. Life becomes easier when you're stronger, you're more flexible, you're in good shape, you can breathe, you're like, you know, your body's working well, that's a good reason to do those things. As a nice side benefit, yes, maybe you will add some time, you know, on this planet, that's possible probably likely in some ways. But what we really want to do is not eliminate your fear of death completely, because that's not realistic. Being afraid of death is normal for all human beings. I cannot say that enough in this episode, we're trying to get to the point where you bring that threat response or that threat meter down to normal levels again in your life, so that your resiliency returns mentally and emotionally, your reasoning abilities come back online. And then the the, the weight you give to the death variable when you do the math minute by minute in your day, in your life, the value of the death variable shrinks back down to normal levels and you throw it out. It doesn't become part of the equation minute by minute. If you decide that you want to go jump off a tall building with a parachute on in New York City, then sure, you know, the death variable is going to come brr, back in the equation and rightly so. You know, you will consider it at a much higher value at that point, rightly so, but that's more of a normal relationship with the death variable. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get to the point where your relationship with death and your understanding of it and your fear of it shrinks back down and occupies an expected or normal position in, in your life like it does for everybody. All right, so I don't really have a whole lot more to say about this. Hopefully it wasn't too heavy for you guys to hear. You know, we... We did have to acknowledge the fact that it is the fate for all of us. We do not get to know what day it's going to happen. There's a tremendous amount of uncertainty here, right? The takeaways here, the fear of death is normal for all human beings, all of us. Do not feel that you are broken because you are afraid of death or that you are fixated on death. You are not. Like all human beings go through that. The difference is the magnification and the distortion and the amount of weight you put on the death variable and running the math of your day moment by moment. If you think about it that way, like in math terms, that's the problem. And how is the problem solved? Not by somehow convincing yourself that death is okay. Believe me, I tried that. I read all kinds of spiritual books. I delved into all kinds, all, all the world's religion. I was, I was digging furiously to find that thing 
that would make me okay and make my fear go away. And guess what? I learned a lot of really cool stuff that I love now that I've been able to incorporate into my life. That was a good exercise, but it was a, a fruitless exercise in terms of trying to solve my death fear. What solved my death fear was, was being able to drive on the highway again, was being able to leave the house again, was being able to stay home alone, not being afraid of panic. In the end, that solved my irrational and distorted fear of death. So your, the object of your game here is to not somehow find the magic words that will no longer make you fear death or like the magic inspirational thing that will make you choose life over death. It ain't going to happen. Your, your job here is to modulate down your threat detection system, your threat response system, like we talk about all the time in these anxiety problems, so that your ability to put death back into its normal place in your life returns. That's what we're after here. Right. So while death anxiety may seem like a special thing because I mean, it's death. Come on, man. It's death. There's no there's no more important topic than that. Right. A lot of people would argue that. OK. And we could again, we could argue that philosophically in a really interesting and probably fruitful debate. Right. Probably get a lot out of that on, a, on an intellectual basis, philosophical basis. So I get that, man. Nothing's more important than death. You can't dismiss that, dude. Like, all right, I, I get you. But again, you know, that's not a compelling argument that says, Nothing is more important than death, so I am now justifying the distorted and irrational view of death that I have. A lot of times, be careful about that, right? Be careful about that. When somebody like me tells you the things I'm telling you right now, your response might be, but I don't get that. Like, it's death. How can you say that? I know, but right now, your view of death is, is distorted and magnified, right? The importance you're putting on it, the value you give to the variable, is out of line right now. So if that starts to shrink back down to normal levels then you'd probably be on the same page with me and we could talk more productively about death. And you could ponder death and think about death more productively like human beings do. It will be part of your existence, right? Part of our existence is pondering our non-existence. What are you going to do? It might be a gift. It might be a curse. I don't know. That's not for us to debate today. But that's the deal about death and, you know, death and anxiety around death and the fear of death. That is it. And magnification and distortion through the fear lens Disordered anxiety will throw everything out of whack, everything, including that. Really not a big mystery. Hopefully that makes you feel a little bit better. This is a tough one. I, I will freely admit this is a hard conversation to have. Most people don't want to talk about this. They want to talk about it, but they're afraid to talk about it. I, I hope I've done a reasonable job of boiling it down into something somewhat useful for you guys. And it's a thing I'm sure we're going to talk about as time goes on. We'll, we'll continue to have this discussion here and there, right? So... If you have questions, if you have comments, send them on, send them my way. If you're not in the Facebook group, please join. You can find that at uh, theanxioustruth.com slash links. We'll get you a link to the Facebook group if you want to join. That's where you're most likely to be able to interact with me, by the way, is in the Facebook group. I'm most active there. I'm very active on Instagram, but it's hard to interact on Instagram. So join the Facebook group if you're not there. We can talk about this a little more. And um, what else can I tell you? I'm going to ask a favor. Of course, I always do. If you're listening to the podcast on iTunes or any platform that lets you rate or review the podcast... Take a second and leave a five-star rating if you dig the podcast, and then take like 15 more seconds to write two or three sentences about how you like the podcast because it helps other people find it. So if you're getting help in the podcast, that would help other people get help too, and that would make me feel good. So I'd appreciate it if you did that. All right, folks, this has been episode 155. I appreciate you uh, taking the time for me, as you always do every week. I really, really appreciate you guys. Hopefully, I am helpful to you. That's the object of the game here. And I'm going to leave you, as always, with my friend Ben Drake doing Afterglow. You can find Ben at bendrakemusic.com. Thanks for coming by, guys. See you next week. You got the feeling that you're going to win. Yeah, you're doing fine. Now in the city and you're living fast. No looking back or dwelling on the past. You know you'll never get another chance. So go and live your